Hello and welcome, Katrina. How are you doing today? I'm fine, thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Awesome. Katrina, I'm really excited to talk with you today, especially on the topic of confidence, confidence versus control. Um, ladies, Katrina is an ex people pleaser, and she's really learned to turn that around. I'm looking forward to hearing this. Um, for those of us who suffer from potentially this conversation of our self worth and, and uh, the relationships, um, Katrina is here to support us today. So Katrina, thanks. For being here. It's my entire pleasure, Melissa. Thank you for inviting me. Awesome. So um, just as we were getting on here today, Katrina, you had mentioned to me about how you were able to turn around people pleasing. Can you tell us a little bit about that? It's because I think many people reject this, this need we've got to people please, right? But it's really ingrained in many, many women. I don't know as so much about men, but I'll just talk about women. So that's not to say that we are fundamentally different, but this is, this is what I've observed. We're very good at people pleasing because we want to belong, right? We don't want to be rejected. And we have an idea somewhere that we are not good enough as we are. So we need to do something extra to please other people. So we practice doing that from when we're babies, I think, mm -hmm. and we get really, really good at it. So we can please, I mean, I used to be a professional people pleaser, meaning that I was on stage and I was completely fake but charmingly so, but completely fake, right? So I didn't know when I spoke to people whether they really liked me, probably not, because I wasn't showing me, right? I was doing this fake version of me and I could manipulate people into finding me completely charming. But where did that leave me? Well, that left me without any knowledge about whether these people really liked me because I never showed myself. But what I was really good at and what many, many, many women are really good at is noticing what pleases other people. And once you know that, you can choose to please if it so suits you or not. So you, you know what other people want. You know what makes them happy. You know what they want to experience in life. And if you allow that to just inform you without it, influencing your behavior without you starting to behave differently well then you're just informed of really what makes other people tick and that is a great great gift to have because many people are unaware of it and we as people pleasers we really know exactly what it is that they like and we can be aware of that and not have it change how we behave do you see what i mean Yes, I do. Yes, I do. So what is, you know, for the ladies who are listening right now, and they're thinking to themselves that they're feeling the weight, you know, when you're a supporter, and you're, you know, you've got your family, spouse, all those things, and you're used to what's that first advice to be able to, to switch so that they're using this for their benefit, and not as like that weight weighing them down. Yeah, so we can practice, right? We don't have to go all in, we can just start displeasing a little bit. Right? Because for us to be able to choose uh, whether we want to transform our behavior to please or not, we can take it in little incremental steps. And I think one of the things we find difficult is to say no and mean it. Yeah. So we end up saying yes, yes, yes. Like we become automatic yes saying machines and we just say yes to everything. And that is part of the way, I think, because we take on too much. And we start confusedly believing that if we're not pleasing other people, they won't be happy. Yes. I mean, how pretentious is that? How pretentious is that? We, other people can be perfectly happy without us, whether we are pleasing or not. So we can start integrating that into our formula a little bit, and then we can go back practicing on people. So we can practice what, I, what we do in my femininity formula course, we practice on shop assistants. I mean, they can be adorable. Obviously, they are people in their own right, but they're excellent material for us to practice on because they're used to hearing no. So if you go into a shop and you've got somebody to explain to you for 10 minutes how some gadget works that you don't want, but you just let them explain and you talk to them and you develop a relationship. And then when they say, okay, so are you taking this item? You just say, that was really nice. Thank you for explaining it to me, but no, thank you. 
can be really, uh, really difficult for someone. It's really hard. It's really hard. It's really hard. But just think that the person is getting paid to do this. So it's okay. Yeah. They're practicing their selling skills. You're not being rude, right? You're not being disagreeable. You're listening. You're being kind. But you know that you're going to say no. And that is okay. So once you start practicing with people who don't really matter to you, you become better and better at saying no and letting people down. Mm. Right. So you can start letting more important people down. You can start letting your spouse down. You can start letting your children down because you cannot guarantee their happiness anyway, can you? Because you don't control your environment. You don't control the world. You don't control the universe. So they might as well get used to some things going wrong. And why not you? doing something different one day, not being there for them or not pleasing them or saying no completely unexpectedly. So it's easier to practice on people who are not important to us once you get really good at that practice, once you get to feel okay, perhaps even comfortable with saying no to a shop assistant who just spent 10 minutes on you. I think you can graduate into saying no to your mom <laughs> Mm -hmm. to whatever to your friends to your family so the power of no is that your yes just get up leveled because mm -hmm. if you are able to say no it means that when you say yes it's a real 100 percent yes isn't it it is oh i love that um as you were talking it made me think about you know, even in my own struggle of confidence and, and standing up to my own yeses and the ability to say no, um, I actually found that I struggled with knowing what I wanted. I struggled with even having confidence in what I actually wanted. What would you say to any listeners that may be saying that they don't even know what they want to say yes to? And uh, this is just my favorite topic of all time. Thank you so much, Melissa, for, for offering this up for, for discussion, because I, I know that you do know. Mm. I know that you, do, you know, and I know that everybody knows, but we like to get a little bit confused about it because the more confused about it we can allow ourselves to get, the less we have to evolve into the person who becomes that, who is that, who has that, who does that. So the longer we can stay in confusion and say, oh, I don't know what I want. I mean, how ridiculous is that? You just have to go out into the world and try it out. All day, you are being given precious information about what you like and what you don't like. So I don't like uh, somebody shouting into my face. I don't like that. I don't want that. So yeah. that must mean I, I like something different. right? So every time you come across something that you don't like, it's fine. It's just like life teaching you what you don't like. And life also teaches you what you do like. And you can tell what you do like when you're feeling pleasure. I mean, mm. it's as simple as that. If you're feeling pleasure doing something, watching something, uh, saying something, thinking something, sensing something, well, that is your desire. That is what you want. And you might not know the end result of that, like if I can give a personal example of this, I want to live, I already live in France, but I want to live in a French chateau, an 18th century, beautifully restored French chateau, right? That's my dream. So I didn't know that for the longest of times, but I knew that I love beauty. Hmm. I, I knew that I love creating beauty. I like sophistication, I like luxury. I'm drawn to that. So I keep following that when I see beauty. Yes, I say that's for me. When I see luxury, yes, that's for me. I want that. When I see all those things, I say, yes, that, that is what I want. This is what I like. So I keep following my pleasure. And so that leads me to my dream. And so I could say that my dream, I can follow my dream by following my pleasure and my dreams know the way, meaning that my dreams will lead me to exactly where it is I want to resign, won't they? Wow, there's so much power. What I'm hearing is the power in the yes um, and the power in the no. Like that, that was very eye-opening to me. Um, 
as a woman, a lot, and especially in the last season of my life, you know, raising kids, marriage, divorce, marriage again, more kids. <laughs> I don't know if I mentioned this, Katrina, but I'm a mom of nine, so I got lots going on. <laughs> um, and somewhere along the way, I lost me, right? I lost me, and and maybe I never really grounded myself in who I was, but I love this idea that as we elevate, you said elevate the yes, as we pay more attention to the yes, we elevate that. Um, all right, so I'd love to know more. When we were talking before, you had mentioned uh, confidence versus control. Confidence versus control. And I'd love to kind of step into that conversation um, and you know, just take it away. What, what would you like to share on this topic of, a lot of women here are looking for confidence. They think confidence, including myself, confidence is where it's at, but is it? So I'd love for you to share some more. Yeah, so we need self-confidence to feel good, don't we? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> if we're not feeling confident, we're not feeling good. So of course we want to feel confident. But what happens with many women is that it's easy for us to feel shame. So we feel shame about our body size, about our hair color, I don't know, about our lack of education or too much education or our taste. or We feel so much shame around so many things. So we found a brilliant way of getting out of shame, and that was to step into blame, because blame feels better than shame, doesn't it? And it feels so good just to be able to say, oh, I'm so fat, because the food industry puts lots of sugar into everything, so I can't help it, I'm fat, right? I used to think, wow, I'm too fat to be lovable. So we, we, we get all these identities that we take on. So we start identifying with being fat. And so we can either go into blame, which makes us feel better, right? It's, it's not my fault, right? It's not my fault, it's somebody else's fault. Somebody made me eat this. But if we do that, we just stay in the shame and the blame and that goes on and on and on. And what happens here is that we lose confidence because we're not really speaking our truth because we're not taking responsibility. So if we are fat, and I'm sorry to be so crude, I can say that very easily because I used to be fat. So if we feel fat and we esteem that we are fat, it must be because at some point we overate. I mean, if you stop eating for six months, you will become slimmer, won't you? So we can think of a lot of excuses why we are fat, and that is about the blame. But if we just stop and say, okay, I'm fat. I must have overeaten at some point. Oh, right. And if I can stop myself from judging myself, if I cannot take on the identity and just say, okay, I made a mistake. I am not a mistake. I made one, right? So I don't take it, I don't take it on as an identity. I keep it outside. But I take responsibility of making a mistake. So once we can allow that mistake to exist out there, taking responsibility for it without blaming ourselves, without blaming other people, we just take on the responsibility. Then we can start thinking, okay. So I'm Katrina, I'm a person who, who can be fat and who sometimes makes mistakes. Oh, right, okay. Uh, so if I don't want to be fat, I have to modify my behavior, right? I'm taking responsibility of that. So I can allow myself to be wrong, right? Mm. I can allow myself to make mistakes. No big deal. Like I like to say, um, never perfect, always genuine. Because when you move into the genuine and you show up um, with confidence, you take responsibility. But we as women, we sometimes think we need the control piece because we think, well, how can I be confident when I don't control anything, right? How can I feel confident when I can't make sure I get it right? So we are craving that perfection piece where we need to know that we will be right. And then if we don't get it right, it's our identity that suffers. So I used to be a classical musician. I used to perform on stage. So I would play a piece of music. If it went well, I could allow myself to feel good about myself, 
Till next time. If I made a mistake, that meant that I was wrong. I was wrong. It wasn't I made a mistake. I'm still who I am. I'm still gorgeous. I'm still lovable. I'm still worthy. I made it mean that I was wrong. And as I cannot control everything in life, I'm bound to be sometimes wrong to get it wrong. But that doesn't mean that I am wrong. So when we are trying to control, when we are trying to prove our worth through the outcome of our actions, mm. that is when we lose confidence. So I know this is a lot of information, a lot of concepts, but we can boil it down to if we are able to take responsibility, even when we get it wrong and have that be all right, then we are touching confidence. Then we just need to build it up. Do you see what I mean? Yes. Yes, I do. That quite powerful, quite powerful. I kept hearing um, as you were talking about identity and worth and this this conversation of control, controlling outcome and how that feeds it um, to the woman out there that's saying, how do I how do I get back to my true identity? What advice would you have for her? Well, you never stop being yourself, really, did you? Hmm. I mean, we are always ourselves. It's just, as you said, before we started this interview, when we talked together, you said that it's so difficult getting rid of the mask and keeping it off. But we are still us, and we sometimes choose to take on a mask. Hmm. And every time we put on the mask, we lose confidence. Because it's a mask that allows us to carry on and I can tell another personal story here, but I will come back to your question. I used to also teach English. I used to inflict English on innocent French children. And they taught me so much because I thought I had to put on a teacher mask when I went into the classroom. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't just be me. I needed to put on that teacher mask. So become a teacher. And the children just wouldn't have it because they could see that I was fake. That is fake, right? So they weren't having it. When I took off the mask, it was really scary because it meant becoming vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Because if you're showing up as you are, when you get criticized, it's you who's being, being criticized, isn't it? It's not the mask, it's not your persona. When you've got the mask on, you're criticized, you can just say, okay, they didn't like my mask. But when you're getting criticized, being vulnerable, then that is really difficult, unless you have got the confidence piece in place. Mm. Once you know that I can be in front of those school children, I can allow myself to be vulnerable. Vulnerable doesn't mean oversharing, right? Vulnerable doesn't mean that you will crumble up in front of children or tell them uh, climate change will ruin their lives. It doesn't mean <laughs> being vulnerable like that. It just means that you're showing up as who you really are adapted obviously to children right so once you're able to do that you can do it with confidence because you are no longer controlling the outcome right you are no longer attaching your self-worth to your performance to the outcome mm. so you will go away from a disasters class with the same idea of your self-worth as you went in you don't make it mean that you are a rubbish teacher if the children are playing up, right? You are not attaching who you are and what you do to the feedback you are getting from other people. So that allows you to be a little bit uh, vulnerable. And obviously you want to think about how vulnerable you want to be really because mm -hmm. I don't think oversharing is really a good idea for most people and I don't think that is being who you are either so up to each one of us to find out how can I be a little bit daring in my vulnerability how can I show a little bit more of myself you can see it as being dressed like I live in France and we like to dress up a little bit sexy sometimes we don't think we're flirting, right? But other people might call it flirting, but we think it's just being us, right? Mm -hmm. So you can think about dressing up 
you in some clothes that are a little bit revealing. How much do you want to reveal? But like you don't want to be naked. But <laughs> maybe you want to reveal a little bit of a shoulder. See how that feels. What's the reaction you get? Do you like it? And again, it's about finding out what you like. So do I like revealing a little bit of one shoulder or don't I? If I don't like it, I won't. So we have to go out into the world trying things out. We can't sit at home figuring it all out. I don't think that's possible. I mean, I don't, maybe we could meditate our way there. I don't know. But I mean, most of us can't. Like we've got jobs, we've got children, we've got things to do. So we've really just got to experiment, making sure that we feel safe, but admitting, admitting that we are taking a risk. Mm. So, so I don't good. know whether that was useful. So good, so powerful. Um, what I'm hearing is even taking those little courageous, you said daring, little daring steps. And what did you, earlier you said, and knowing that we're not wrong, you're not wrong, it's like, um, as you dare to kind of discover who you are, stepping out, taking the masks off, showing yourself vulnerable, it's scary and yet it can be fun. Like we can almost make it fun, <laughs> which is awesome. You can flirt with it. Think about you being fully buttoned up as I am now because it's a bit cold here and being naked. Mm. So there's everything in between. How much do you want to show? If you've always been buttoned up the way I am today, maybe even wearing a hat, well, maybe you could start off by taking off your hat and see how that feels. And that is obviously an image for being a little bit more authentic, showing a little bit more of yourself. So maybe you want to perhaps disagree. And I think we can say everything we want to say as long as we say it with love as long as we come from the pure intention of just expressing ourselves, not of criticizing somebody, but if we know that I'm saying what I'm saying and I'm coming from love, love of me, because I feel that here now, I'm being asked to give my opinion and I will give my opinion in the most charming and acceptable way possible, making sure that I'm not criticizing, I'm not making somebody else wrong to be right. Hmm. So I can be right, they can be right, we can both be right in two different ways, right? I don't have to tell somebody else that he or she is wrong. I can just start speaking my mind because I've got that confidence behind me. But being confident doesn't mean that I think I'm better than other people, hmm. right? So we come from feeling less worth than other people from feeling worse than other people. Now, if we want to be confident, it doesn't mean that we are better. It just means that we are worth the same. So I think that is real confidence. I love that. I love that. All right. So what would be your top three tips, tangible takeaway uh, to the lady that is looking to create confident in and take those courageous steps into her future? How can she walk this out? Three steps or three mm. tips. Mm, what a gorgeous question. <laughs> so if she wants to feel confident about the gorgeous woman that she already is, even though she may not be able to see it, she could first think about, first step, who is it that I would want to be? So if let's say she wants to have an online business selling her paintings, but not in a physical store online, she could start thinking about, so when in three years from now, I've got my successful online business that sells my artwork, um, what will my day look like? What will I be doing during my day? How does it pan out for me? How much time do I spend in front of the computer? How much time do I spend in front of my paintings? Who will I be meeting? What will I be wearing? Where am I living? How does that smell? Mm. Right? So it doesn't mean we have to get it right because we can be almost sure that it won't pan out that way. <laughs> but it could be something equally gorgeous or perhaps something unimaginably thrilling and delightful, right? So just try and feel into it in three years from now. What would that be? What would that, how would I be there? How could I embody the person? Right, so those are a lot of questions. But just to say that 
think about how your ideal day would be in, you can say one year from now, three years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, however much time you want to give yourself. So that would be a delicious first step, just visualizing it. And then my second step would start becoming that or being that. Mm -hmm. So when I say become, it's a bit mm, facetious because we already are. But let's say you want to meet um, the love of your life. Now, if, if you're sitting here in your jogging pants with holes in them, and um, a dirty t-shirt. Just think, if you were meeting your dream man today, would you be wearing that? And I think you'd say no, I hope you'd say no. So as long as you're not dressing as if you were just about to meet him, well, that just tells you how far you are from meeting him. Perfect. So you could start believing that today's the day. Today is a day where I become more of the person who is meeting that love of her life. Who is that woman? Is she somebody who's sitting on her couch watching Netflix all day? Or is she different, right? So I'm being a bit provocative here. But if you could think about what that woman would look like, would she be out there uh, perhaps... Um, being creative or taking classes or which should be out there enjoying life dancing or having drinks in fancy bars or which should be uh studying something uh, which should be in a high-powered job what kind of woman would that be and do you want to be that woman and if you don't want to be that woman we'll change it into something <laughs> you want to be right so you're already much clearer on what it is that you want to be so you can start embodying that and then the third step would be to feel the fear, but doing it anyway. So feel the fear. And you can dose the fear between blind panic and zero fear comfort zone, right? You can do anything in between. So think about what step could I take today? And I'm not saying tomorrow, I'm saying today. So it's 10 o'clock in the evening. What step could you still take tonight that would make you more of the woman who is what you dream to embody? Could be buying some new underwear online. It's open 24 seven, right? There's always something you could do. And it might seem frivolous, but I think that frivolity is really what we are called to explore more. But that's a whole mm. different subject. But yeah. you can always take a tiny action step. You can go and look yourself in the mirror and say, actually, I need to wash my hair. And then wash your hair. Simple as that. If you take those tiny, tiny, tiny actions all the time, they accumulate. And one day, what you know, you will be that woman. You will look yourself in the mirror and say, oh my gosh, I, I am that woman who does that. And when you are that, and when you realize you are that woman, well, then you will be living that dream. And, and you can't come and tell me now, Melissa, that I don't know what I want because you just created it. So, so powerful. I want to take those three tips and put them on replay for myself <laughs> every single evening. Um, I heard once that a one degree shift or change a day, just one little degree, one little baby step is 365% change in your life in a year. Um, and just the power of little increments. Um, so that was quite powerful. Envisioning who you are, who you want to become, um, stepping into her daily, <laughs> taking an action step every day. And I love what you just said, even if it's 10 o'clock at night, <laughs> no excuses, take a step. Yeah, say, oh, I'll do that tomorrow. No, do it now. Do it because now. The, the sooner you react, like you get an idea, let me do it straight away. If you get used to behaving like that, you create the momentum. Yes. And that's when it gets out of control because suddenly everything is changing and it's going too quickly, right? So then you start resisting. Oh my God, I'm becoming this, this woman right now. Oh, it's too much. I can't handle it. And that's gorgeous. If you can't handle it, it's perfect. Just, <laughs> just go with it. Just go with it. 
Love it. Love it. Well, Kat Katrina, as we finish this up, is there anything else, any last words that you would like to add um, that may bless our woman or help send her on her way as she becomes confident and courageous in pursuing her passions? Yes. I would like to say that you have already got everything it takes. You don't have to do any more courses. You don't have to have any more money. You don't have to live in a different area. You don't have to lose 50 pounds or even two pounds. You have got everything it takes right now. It's just a question of getting started. So maybe you're feeling it's difficult to get started. Find something that's easy. Love it. Well, Katrina Horn, thank you so much for your time today. Um, would you uh, highlight for our leaders, because you are a coach, you help women to own their worth, you help them to pursue their dreams and their passions, and anyone looking or on here today that would like to connect with you, what is the best way for them to get back to you directly? They could just hop on my website, which is www.katrinahorn.com. And um, either contact me directly, whether the contact form, or maybe they want to download something I've got on my website, or um, we'll just get in touch via social media at Katrina Horn, or what should I say, at Katrina Horn Coaching. It's actually my handle. <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so very much for your time. Uh, this has been quite enjoyable. And, um, and I thank you so much for just giving to this audience and pouring out such a blessing. Um, I'm believing blessings right back to you for, um, for your support today. Much love. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Melissa. Thank you.